Rub up your engines! Well, Ford's got a new idea. They got a thing they call breadcrumbs. <laughs> it's just like Hansel and Gretel, who were dropping stuff for the trail so they could make their way back, but unfortunately, the animals ate it and they couldn't find their way back. Ford's breadcrumb system is a high tech system for off roaders. Ford is putting this system in their rangers for off road use. So if you're just driving around off road and then you wonder, hey, did I make a left at that cat tire or did I make a right? It puts little dots on your map system. So you, when you go back, you just have to follow the dots back. And of course, this works out because if you are on a trail, a lot of the maps don't show trails. I mean, that's, you know, it's got road systems. And if you're just going wild off road and you kind of get lost, well, you got your little bread crumb trail and you can just turn around and follow the dots on your map and it's also good for your friends because you can send it to your friends and say where are you well here follow my breadcrumb trail you can send it to them on their phone and then they can follow it you're using uh, satellite navigation so you don't need to have cell phone towers so if you're in the middle of nowhere hey there's still satellites up in space and you can use it to guide yourself and your friends to the campsite bed kind of an interesting idea <laughs> From Hansel and Gretel to Ford Motor Company, Carlos Flores says, what do you think of a Toyota Venza? Thinking about getting it as a family car. All right, they don't make them anymore, but they're excellent cars. It was more or less a sales failure for Toyota. They were too expensive for the price point of what they did and where they fit in the Toyota lineup of vehicles because, you know, it was fancier than a Matrix, but it wasn't as fancy as the Lexus SUV and it was priced in between them. And so they weren't very good sales. They did not have any particular problems. They ran it perfectly fine. I have customers with them that have the V6 engine. I have customers that have them with the four cylinder engines and none of them have had any particular problems with them. They can be an excellent one. And since they don't make any more, you can get a much better price. You can get a much better price on a used Venza than you can on a used Lexus that's a similar vehicle. So it can be a really good car. But always listen to me. Have a mechanic check out any car like that before you buy it. They're high tech. You want to make sure it hasn't been wrecked, flooded, or stolen, or have any serious electronic problem from bad maintenance or something like that. So do have it checked out, but it could be a very good vehicle. Chad then taunts us, Scotty, do you remember the first car you worked on was an easy fix? We had a first car we worked on was my father's 1954 Ford Fairlane with a V8 and a 3 on the tree. It was the first car we ever owned that went over 100 miles an hour. That was something back in the day, you know? Of course, it was easy to work on. There were simple cars. It was a flathead V8, had a big radiator in the front. Everything was easy to get to. You could put a clutch on that thing if you were a good mechanic in less than an hour. Those things were very easy to work on. Back in the day, cars were simple to work on. They didn't have all this complexity. And if you were mechanically inclined, you could work on any of the cars. It really didn't make any difference at all. It wasn't until later, like my grandfather, who was a very good mechanic in the town of New York that we had our gas station, Lewis to New York. This guy, Doc Kirby, was a doctor, one of the richer guys in town. He uh, bought Mercedes Benz and it was fuel injected. My grandfather worked on it for him, but he had a hard time because he didn't know anything about fuel injection. He had to learn about it and stuff. And it got more complicated. But back in the 60s, all the other cars, they were real simple. They were easy to work on. And it was uh, kind of more enjoyable sometimes because you didn't have to deal with the possibility of 10,000 computer things going around and picking the right one. They were more mechanical and easier to figure out. Cat in a trap says, Scotty, what's your view on Suzuki? Suzuki makes great motorcycles. I used to have a 750 Suzuki. It was a screamer. I gave it to my son. It's in Nashville now. It left me and I drive my Triumph Thruxton around. It's a lot slower. It only goes 115 miles an hour. I don't need something that goes 175 anymore. I'm too old. <laughs> But their cars, pieces of junk. They came to the United States. They failed miserably. They were too small. They didn't have enough acceleration. They fell apart. Nobody knew how to fix them. They had horrible automated transmissions. And it's weird because they make such great motorcycles, but they made such crappy cars. Now, in the rest of the world, a lot of people like those little Suzuki mini Jeeps and stuff. They're very popular in the Virgin Islands and different places. But for the cars they sold in the United States, they didn't last long and they were junky. Don't buy one. You can't get parts for them in the United States. You get them cheap 
you can still get parts. Hey, go ahead if you don't mind a cheap little car, but they failed in the United States. All the road, Kento 90, so Scotty Green is from Toronto. I just bought a 2011 Honda Fit automatic transmission with 100,000 kilometers for a gram from a grandma. What do you suggest to make it last 250,000 kilometers? Change the oil and filter every 5,000 or a mile or so. Change the transmission fluid every 30,000 miles and baby it. And you can get that. I have customers get that as long as you take care of it. Now, if they're still using tons of salt on the road in Toronto, I went to college there for four years. If they're still using salt, what you want to do is every once in a while bring it in a heated garage and rinse all the salt off the undercarriage so it doesn't rust. So you keep the rust off of the thing, but you maintain them. Huh? Those things can last a really long time. You know, you got it from a grandma. She probably babied it. And that's a good thing because the problem with buying Hondas, you buy one from a kid, it could be, you know, 99% worn out, but you bought it from a grandma, it's probably still got tons of life left in it. Red Mikowski 24 says, hello, Mr. Kilmer. How good is the Ford factory remanufactured tranny? I'm thinking about buying one from my 2011 Ford. Well, they're generally excellently rebuilt transmissions. Years ago, a friend of mine who's now dead, he got bit by a rabid kitten and got rabies and died. Now, what a way to go. Told me, he says, Scotty, with Fords nowadays, he said, I don't even rebuild them. I buy the factory rebuilds because they're so well made that I can give them a good warranty. I know it's going to work. I install it and everybody's happy. He knew what he was talking about. They're well built and they get a good guarantee on it. You know, you pay a little bit more for a factory rebuilt one. But yes, they are, especially with the trucks, they're really good for the trucks because the trucks go so long and then the transmission's the first thing to go. And hey, if you can get 150,000 miles out of a transmission, you put another one from a factory in and it lasts another 150, what the heck, you're getting your money's worth out of it. Take it a keg 96 says I got a 98 Chevy S. Astro van, it won't crank. There's no communication with the pass lock module. As I always tell people when the car doesn't start and you got a problem with the anti-theft system, make sure that you got at least one more known good key in a drawer somewhere. Try that. Could be that that just doesn't work anymore. Now, if that doesn't work, it's going to be beyond your ability to repair it because one, you got to figure out what's wrong. You need a high level scan tool that can do bi-directional testing of the pass lock system. And two, you have to be able to reprogram it if it needs new parts. Now, from my experience on a 98 Chevy s van, usually it's the pass lock module that goes bad in the dash. But like I say, even if you bought one, it's not going to start. You got to be able to reprogram it. So do as I tell my customers to do. Try to find a locksmith in your area that works on those pass lock systems. There's a lot of locksmiths today that work on cars because it's a profitable thing. And with all those keyless ignition systems, they've learned how to fix those too. Now yours is a 98, so it's not a keyless system. You got a key. Find a locksmith. They do house calls. You won't have to tow it anywhere. They can come and fix it at your house. And if you do find a good one, tell all your friends so they'll know. Because if you got to take it to a mechanic, you're going to have to tow it to the mechanic. Then you're going to have to pay his mechanic rates. And most mechanics charge a hundred something dollars an hour. And locksmiths work for a lot less than that. Often even half of what a mechanic will charge. So gotta find a good locksmith in your area. They're handy for all kinds of things. And especially for modern cars with all this computerized key crap that they have learned how to fix. And they bought the equipment. I got equipment for that kind of stuff, but I don't like working on it. You have to pay for the right to access the software for each car manufacturer. And I don't know how many cars I'm going to work a different model, so I don't want to get involved in it. But the locksmith guys, they do it for a living, so they have the software for all the cars. Mike Inselman says, yeah, I used to have a customer, Mike Inselman. I wonder if it's the same guy. Scotty, I have a 99 Jeep Grand Cherokee. The ABS and brake lights stay on all the time. ABS and brake lights often come on together because of one problem. What you want to do is have the vehicle scanned. But have it scanned with a good scan tool, not some cheap $10 dongle or $49 scan tool, a good one. One that reads the ABS code systems entirely. See what the codes are. You can email me the codes. I can analyze it and tell you what the codes mean. But they're very complex systems. But when those lights are on, there are codes set. Now, you want to pray it's something simple, like maybe the right front speed sensor is broken or the wire is unplugged. And you can easily plug it in or put another one. There's a lot of reasons they can come on. But the only way you're going to find out is by having a scan and getting the code. And I have many customers that they get those lights on and I explain, well, your ABS brake module's bad. That's a $1,500 part. And they say, well, it stops good enough for me. And they just continue to drive them that way and they, they don't care. But at least then they know what the problem is. You got to get the code to find out what it is first. 
then you go from there. All right, we got a motorcycle question. Raiden Makowski 24 says, Mr. Kilmer, any thoughts on the 2020 Triumph Daytona 765 Moto 2 Limited Edition Road Legal Moto 2 World Championship? I drive a Triumph, but it's a Thruxton. It's the two-cylinder one, and you know, it doesn't go that fast. It only goes like 116 miles an hour. It's not a racing motorcycle. 2020 Daytona 765 is a racing type bike. It's the three-cylinder motorcycle engine. That was what got Triumph back into the speed business ages ago when they made the Triumph Speed Triple, and the BSA had the same basic configuration, they won at Daytona, that's why it's called Daytona, they're very fast motorcycles, but they're also extremely expensive, you're going to spend that kind of money on a motorcycle, you got that kind of money, you want to toy around with one, go right ahead, they're fast motorcycles, me, I would never put that kind of money on a motorcycle, because even on my two-cylinder Triumph, I'm not going to spend what they want for a new one, I bought a used one for about half price of a new one with 8000 miles on the clock. It's much better to buy them used and save 50% of the money than it is putting all that money out. But if you've got that kind of money and you want to buy a motorcycle, it's very fast. They're nice looking bikes and they got that unique three cylinder engine sound that most motorcycles have. So if you got the money, you don't mind spending it, go right ahead. Me, I'm too cheap. I'd wait years till I get a used one. <laughs> So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.